My name is uh, Steve Clark, and I work with um, Hub Zero, which is now stationed at new, uh, you know, SDSC. And today I'll be uh, sharing a presentation with Daniel Mejia, who works with uh, NanoHub Group here at Purdue. Uh, we'll be talking about something we've called Sim Tools, and soft, which uh, the sort of the subtitle is Software Tools that, that are Fair. And so what I hope you all see on the screen is um, an agenda uh for today and we've sort of broken it up into several sections here so we'll start with an introduction which is um you know a bunch of slides uh, and provide some motiv motivation and reasoning for why we develop sim tools uh, daniel will then go through um, an introduction to jupyter notebooks and how to use them on nanohub uh, then i will come back and we'll um walk through an actual an existing sim tool sort of get your uh, so you can get your eyes on it and if we have time and I, I think we will uh, we'll let you loose on it and you can play with it run it a little bit edit it just just kind of play with it and get your feet wet uh, and then the the major part of the time should be uh, element number four here uh, where we're going to have you attempt to build your own sim tool uh, we have a uh, you know, well-defined problem that that hopefully can be solved in the in the time we have, uh, and then uh, sort of wrap up with some uh, talk on advanced topics about uh, how this sim tools integrates with Hub Zero, and then uh, if there's any time left, we'll have uh, time for questions or or any discussion. Let's see. And. Number two. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we're going to start off um, by basically presenting the sort of background material uh, and motivational um, inspiration for why we're doing sim tools. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, I'm Steve. I'm also uh, Daniel is here today, and Ali Strachan is sort of the leader of the. Uh, NanoHub group that's doing the development work here. Uh, so uh, I've mentioned, you know, Hub Zero or NanoHub, but this also applies to um, other types of gateways. You don't, you don't need uh, to be a Hub Zero gateway to, to use this or appreciate its benefit, I hope. Uh, so one of the, the major um, uh, purposes of gateways is to accelerate innovation. Uh, especially in the area of, of science and uh, data and simulation. Uh, so they do this, uh, hopefully, with they have user-friendly uh, applications. And that's uh, an, another major uh, purpose, is they take some of the sting out of, out of using some scientific applications. So on the left here, uh, basically, there's just a lot of names of a lot of different packages that could be integrated in different ways. It may be used on um, various science um, gateways. <clears throat> Some of them are data-oriented repositories. Uh, most of them listed here are software or, or tools that can be used for uh, various uh, purposes. Uh, the icons here, we have uh, users in the lower left, or sorry, user in the lower right corner, uh, and developers uh, on the left. Uh, and they both um, uh, serve, have different roles within the gateway. Uh, so on a Hub Zero gateway, Hub Zero um, will stand up a instance and it will have provide several services that are associated with that that are that are used um, for simulation and, and data management. Uh, the, on the user side, uh, there are multiple sort of categories uh, of users. There's uh, research scientists or research engineers. Uh, you also have people that are more interested in education or classroom uh, sort of use and teaching or putting out just educational material for people to learn on their own. Um, so, uh, and sort of the ties everything together, uh, there's an online uh, presence for simulation um, and you could tie these tools together into some sort of a workflow. Uh, and in the last several years, um, topics of data science and machine learning have become uh, much more prevalent. And um, so we're getting into that, that field as well. So the, the idea behind uh, SimTools is it's um, an opportunity for 
uh, to sort of update our simulation and data, data delivery uh, platform and make it more modern. Um, and the, in, the, in the title, we mentioned the word FAIR, which is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and this is a, a standard that, that applies um, mostly to data. Um, and each of these various uh, uh, four categories are explained here in more detail. Um, but the punchline for what we're trying to do here is that the same sort of um, approach should be taken to simulation tools. <clears throat> the simulation tools also need to be findable. I mean, what if you have a tool, if nobody can find it, you know, what good is it? Uh, so it, it needs to be accessible. Uh, and this, uh, you know, it needs to be open. It needs to be, you know, once you find it, you also be able need to have access to it so you can use it. Um, interoperable is definitely useful. You know, we all have horror stories of trying to, you know, cobble together this script with that script with this code with the other code and you're you know you're always putting um some sort of shim in between them um and that's something that we would you know like to move away from uh, and just like data it would be good if the simulation tools could be you know reused and repro and there's a, a fifth option here they should also be reproducible results uh and this is further um sort of uh, enhanced by uh, something called the scientific data at, at nature. And this, again, this is where the principles for data have been lined out, you know, and, um, laid out uh, in, a, in a sort of a standards approach. And um, again, we would like to take a similar approach to simulation tools. Uh, and so that's what we would like to do. And the question is, we do. Why don't we already do that today, or do people already do that today? And our experience is that um, that's typically not the case. Uh, so here, um, take an example of uh, molecular dynamic simulation, where you want to calculate the melting temperature of an alloy. Um, so there are multiple steps in this process. So you might uh, start the process by generating um, an alloy, which is made up of multiple elements in some sort of random structure. Uh, then once the you have these, you know, you have these atoms laid out in some sort of random structure, they interact with each other through various forces, and these forces can be modeled. Um, and there are uh, codes that that's what they do. They model the inner inner uh, actions between atoms. Uh, one of those is open chem. Uh, you put those pieces together, they form like the initial conditions and part of the model for, for molecular dynamics. And you might use a software uh, code known as LAMPS. Well, there are others that would fit in here equally well. Uh, after you run the simulation, you'll, you'll generate trajectory, trajectories of the you know, atomic location, velocity, position, um, forces, and so forth. Uh, and you'll generate a, you know, a big pile of data uh, in, in files and log files and so forth. Uh, and there are tools now available to analyze uh, those files and some of those results. Uh, and one of those uh, is Ovito, which is listed here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if you're trying to uh, you're trying to calculate the melting point, so this is only makes sense if, the, if you have the right phases existent in your solution. Uh, if everything is a solid, well, it didn't melt, so you're not going to have a melting temperature. Uh, so there, you can analyze the data to to um, determine uh, the melting point of your alloy and with a confidence interval. Okay, so um, as we've highlighted by this example, uh, the workflows are complex and involve uh, typically involve multiple steps. Um, and when often what happens when you come to publication time, um, the detail in in the steps is often lost. Um, and you may probably concentrate maybe on the simulation part or on the results part and the other pieces may get lost, which makes it hard to reproduce. Uh, and yeah, and as it says here, the science that, that's published is often hard to reproduce. So that, uh, this is sort of the motivation behind uh, the sim tool approach uh, and making simulation tools that are that it adhere to these fair principles. So the, the sort of the fundamental idea is that 
for a, a sim tool, uh, the developer will create the tool. And part of the definition of the tool is uh, the inputs. Um, and the, the tool is written uh, in the uses a Jupyter notebook as the medium for the tool. Um, all the inputs and outputs um, must be uh, declared and they are not um, optional. Uh, so basically if, if the tool needs an input, it has to be listed as an input. And then when it comes time to run the tool, you must provide some value for that input. Um, the inputs uh, all should have defaults, but um, they're mandatory. Uh, and inside uh, sort of the, the, the workflow box there, um, the, it's treated as essentially a black box where you have the inputs. The outputs are also well-defined, uh, exactly what they are, units, type, so forth. Uh, so the SIM tool must, its job is to convert those inputs through whatever algorithms are necessary to produce those outputs. The entire workflow could be broken down into multiple SIM tools. Uh, it doesn't have to be one. Um, and so once uh, the, the, the SIM tool notebook is, is created um, in, on, on a platform like Hub Zero, you can, you can register it. Uh, it becomes usable by you and others um, who may have a different use for it, but they need the same underlying calculation. Uh, inputs and outputs are verified in terms of, of range and, and units and so forth. Uh, tools um, have DOIs, which makes them indexable by uh, Web of Science and Google Scholar. And also we have um, set up caching and uh, services that will be discussed later in, in the afternoon. Uh, and so that's what the user is going to do. Um, so now, um, briefly um, step through um, a little more detail. And we'll, we'll come back to this uh, more than once through the, through the day. Uh, so don't worry about getting the details here too much. But basically the highlights here is that the inputs are defined in, in something called a, a YAML language, um, which is a nice um, text uh, base uh, for defining all kinds of types of variables. You can define lists and numbers and arrays and so on. Um, and several examples are shown here. Uh, and the same applies, uh, as I mentioned before, inputs and outputs must both be defined. Uh, once you um, define the inputs and outputs, uh, we use a product or a, a, a package called Papermill, uh, which can take the SIM tool notebook and inject uh, parameter values into it, which would be, that's what the variables are. Each time you run it, you'll have a different set of input values, and those can be injected as uh, parameters. Uh, after uh, you take the parameters, um, you'll jump into the algorithm for the SIM tool for whatever problem you're trying to solve. Um, again, really don't pay too much attention to the details here, but basically this is just some arbitrary um, script in a, in a notebook cell. Uh, after the simulation is done uh, within the tool, sim tool, you may have some processing and, and uh, results to do. Uh, in this case, um, it's taking some values out of a log file and it's going to put them into some arrays or compute numbers based on that. And once uh, you've com you know, computed those values or generated the text that you want to save, uh, within the sim tool, uh, you use this uh, basically this database save operation. So for every output that you defined at the beginning, you need to have a save statement here at the end. Um, all right, so that's uh, from the developer side. From, from the user side, um, we've mentioned, or I've mentioned that these things are findable and accessible. Um, so one of the ways you can find them uh, is there's a, as part of the sim tool library, there's basically a function uh, called find uh, sim tools. Uh, you can run that and print out the results and you'll get a list of all of the sim tools that are installed or published within the hub. Um, for each one, there's a brief description, which is part of the sim tool definition itself. Uh, so it, it behooves you to, to put in some text in the description, uh, like 
this particular tool has no description, so it just shows up as null. Um, so keep your users in mind when you fill out this section of your SIM tool. Uh, once presented with this list, uh, you may find, you know, hopefully you're looking for something and, and from the, the text that's given, uh, hopefully you can find one that solves the problem that you're interested in. Uh, in this case, we're looking for one that has to do with, with melting uh, of alloys, and so that's the melting kin tool. Uh, so there's a, a second function, which is to search for it, which actually goes out and finds where the files or the, the notebook, uh, the SIM tool is installed on the, on the disk system uh, and returns this melt kin object. Uh, once you have the, the object that's sort of the representation of the, of the SIM tool, you can query its inputs. Uh, with the sim tool input function and the same on the output side. And what's returned is the basically the type uh, default value. Um, for numbers, you'll get min and max if they've been de uh, declared um, and so on. So depending on the type, uh, which here we have choice element um, number, uh, the attributes may be different. Um, Uh, okay, so now you have the uh, default values um, and you want to set the values to something else uh, because you have either you know, a different initial guess or you have a different chemical alloy or you know, whatever it is that might change for your particular run. Uh, so what is shown here is how you assign values to the various uh, parameters. So uh, T solid is a, is a number, uh, it has units of temperature. Uh, so here, um, it was somebody tried to set it to 50,000 degrees C. Um, it turns out that that's out of range. Um, so you get back an error right away that says that's out of range. Uh, and you will not be allowed to use that value in your simulation. So you reset it and set it to 1,000. And it turns out that that's um, inbounds. Uh, the other feature here is that the, um, the SIM tool itself is expecting temperature to be in Kelvin, not in uh, centigrade or Celsius. So the, actually, the, the, we use the pint library to do the unit conversion. So you can enter it in centigrade or Celsius, it'll convert it to Kelvin. The simulator itself doesn't have to deal with that. The sim tool doesn't have to do unit conversion. Uh, yeah, OK. All right. Uh, and then it's very simple to run the tool. There's just a simple run command. Um, you get some sort of progress as it's, as it's moving towards the end, uh, moving through the cells. Uh, basically, this says it's run, it's on cell number 18 of 34. So you get some sort of gauge as to how it's progressing. Um, at the end, uh, after it's complete, uh, you have the option to read any of the values that were produced. Um, and so there's a read, like there was a save function inside the SIM tool. The corresponding function outside is called read. And for each value, you can just read it. Um, and this is, again, melting Kim tool. OK, I think this one, the images didn't work very well. Um, but basically, here's a use case where if, uh, you're trying to find a melting point again. Uh, if it's too cold, your alloy uh, will be solid. Uh, if it's too hot, uh, it, it won't have any liquid form, uh, it'll, it'll be no sweat. And what you're looking for, of course, is what's in the middle of the melting point, or yeah, melting temperature. So you may have to vary uh, your alloy. You may have to vary. If, if you're looking for a melting point within a particular range, you may have to change your alloy composition and things like that. Uh, but SIM tool will help you do multiple runs and so forth to, to achieve that goal. Um, other things that you can do, um, you can do sweeps across many different elements or many different types of compositions for um, alloys that you may want to propose to have, you know, particular searching for a particular parameter or uh, value. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, these workflows may be um, machine learning driven. Uh, you could use the SIM tool either as um, part of the machine learning or as a data generator for the machine learning. A couple of different ways that might work. Uh, and more, even more fun you can have is um, uh, what we've shown so far is just basically a standard Jupyter notebook with 
with cells which you uh, sequentially execute. Um, but that's not the only type of interface you can build. You can also build you know, sort of more widget-based interface uh, as shown here, which is a couple of examples on NanoHub listed at the bottom of the page here. So in summary, um, I'm going to just speed through this. Um, the sim tool features, again, are, are built to adhere to these fair principles um, of, of findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and also uh, reproducible, which is uh, an extra advantage. And all right, so one, one last slide here. Um, there is uh, just listed here some additional resources. And this list will be put up uh, again later in the day. Uh, but there is um, sim tool documentation in the read the docs uh, platform. Um, we're going to use this introduction to sim tool uh, demo in, in a little bit later uh, in the tutorial. Uh, and there's some nano of specific stuff here. Uh, for tool contribution process and how to use Jupyter Notebooks, which Daniel will cover next. Uh, there's also, um, if you're interested, the, the Sim tool software itself is avail available through PIP. Uh, there's also a Git repository, which I'm sure you can find. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's um, what I have for that. And depending on how we're doing on time, we may have a opportunity for a quick question. Uh, if not, we can move on to the next section. I think we can okay. keep going. Uh, okay, uh, I'll pass the torch over to Daniel. <clears throat> okay. Oh. Uh, I'm Daniel Mejia. I work with NanoHub at Purdue University. So what I'm going to give you is like a mm -hmm. common ground uh, base idea of what Jupyter notebooks are, how to execute a notebook. If you are familiar with Jupyter, basically I'm just going to repeat basic stuff, but if you are not familiar, it will give you a big overview of what you can do with a Jupyter notebook. So as Steve mentioned before, the SIM tools are using UCP, using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, to use a Jupyter Notebook, we are going to use NanoHub. Uh, on NanoHub, if you want to go to NanoHub, you need to, an, an account to create an, an account on NanoHub. You can use the standard user password, create an, an account and log in with the user password, or you can use your credential from in common or Google to create the account. When you have an account on NanoHub, you can go to your desktop, your dashboard, or you can just type this URL and it will go to this interface when you can launch the tool. If you are in dashboard, you can use search for Jupyter Notebook and it will be the Jupyter Notebook that we will be launching the tool. What an interface in the Jupyter Notebook looks is it will launch a file explorer where you are going to see all your files, all your data. And if you are new on NanoHub, you are going to include this small folder called data. That is where all the sessions of the results from all your simulations are stored. So if you are new on NanoHub, you're only going to have one folder and you can start creating new stuff. So that is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to NanoHub. I'm going to start logging into my account. This is already, so if you are user, really uh, create an account, no, sorry. I think with my NanoHub account in this case, I already have my user and password. And then basically you are logging and you can go to the dashboard. When you go to the dashboard, it's the interface that I showed before. When you have your tools and your sessions. So in our case, we are interested in tools. You can go to all the possible tools on NanoHub, but for this case, we are going to look for Jupyter. So you can look in the Jupyter notebook and if you click here, you will go to the screen that I shown one of those slides. So if you launch the tool, it will create a container that is running Jupyter and you can access that container through a proxy on NanoHub. That is how all the 
external tools work on the Hub Zero uh, framework. And what we are going to do is start building new stuff. So this is my, those are my files. So I have a tons of different files, but things that you can do is with this new, you can create multiple stuff. The first thing is you, if you need a terminal, you can go to a new terminal and from the terminal inside of the Jupyter, you have access to a bash command. So basically you can type your commands. If you have, uh, you go to a specific folder, auto completion, uh, if you can, uh, for example, uh, file the BTK, you can start doing bash stuff. If you have to clone a repository, if you have to transfer files, so you can start doing those commands. If you are not a bash fan and you need a full desktop, you can do it here and instead run a non VNC desktop. And if you run a non, -C, non VNC desktop, all you have is a full Linux desktop that you can run inside of that container and you can go and run different tools. Like if I want to run, for example, Emacs and I have the full control here on Emacs. So I can use user interface. I'm not familiar with the bash command console, right? If I, I'm done here, I can go and close this connection and go back to my, my Jupyter session. So those are the, like the main things that you can create besides creating a Jupyter. When you create a Jupyter, you have to select an environment. For this tutorial, we are going to use Python 3. That is the one that contains all the libraries required for the tutorial. If you create Python 3, it will just create a random name for the, for the notebook. You can change it by just clicking here and it will say, this is going to be my notebook. When you are in the notebook, one of the things that you have to know is notebooks are basically a collection of different cells. Cells can have different types. So if I go in this cell, I can write code like uh, my code. And if I run it, you will see this is a comment on Python. But if I say this is cell is not code, it's a markdown and you run it, it completely behaves completely different. If I say this is just a text file, text, I don't want to do it anything, it will also just stay as it is. Now, the other thing that you can do with those notebook is you can add tags. So if you go to view cell toolbar tags, what you can do is for each of your cell, you can add tags like this one is, uh, this is for coding, uh, coding. Uh, this one is for documentation. So basically you are adding more information or metadata to your notebook. This is used for the simples and Steve will explain a little bit how that is, is done. Uh, and I think that is like the basic instruction. So I'll be back to my slides. This is what I did right now is you can create terminals. If you go to new terminal, you can create a new bash terminal that you can use. You can run VNC desktop. You can create new notebooks. You can change the name. Uh, you can enable the tags and based on the tags, you can add just like documentation beside to your notebook. You can add different types of cells. And if you want to run each of the cells, you can use this button or you can use the, the hotkeys control enter return just to run the cell and stay, stay in the same cell or shift return to execute that cell and run to the next one. And at the end, when you are done with all your work, the idea is you go to terminate the session. If you terminate the session, it will destroy all the kernel. Uh, all your files will be preserved. If you don't destroy or not terminate the session, the session will keep it, will, will be alive. You can access your session going to my session in your dashboard and you can open it or terminate from that interface. But if some session is idle, it will be terminated and all unsaved data will be lost. So that is when you finish, it's a really good idea to go and terminate the session. So that is like the basic common knowledge of 
how Jupyter works, and Steve is going to explain how that works for a scene too. So I'm going back to you, Steve. Okay, so um, I'm going to make a small adjustment here. I think so. I have I have slides for this, but in the interest of time, uh, it would be I, and I, I want people to um, in the end um, start up this the introduction to SimTools tool and actually play with it a little bit. So if you can you can either follow along as I go through the slides or you can um, attempt to launch the tool yourself and, and perform the same actions as I, as I talk about them in the slides. Um, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so uh, just like Daniel started up the Jupyter uh, Notebook tool, uh, you can start up any tool. Basically, all you need to know is its name, uh, or you can go to the dashboard and search for it. Uh, so instead of Jupyter, the name of this tool is Intro to Sim Tools. Um, so cert, Sim Tool is a good search uh, phrase if you want to try that. Um, once you uh, launch that tool, uh, either by, um, you know, by hit, hitting the launch button uh, or uh, to get it started, um, to get past the, the launch page, uh, you should end up with something that looks like this. Uh, and this is what we call a workflow notebook, which is the sort of the, the driving notebook. Uh, it's going to invoke the SIM tool a little bit later. Um, uh, but this is the workflow notebook. And uh, once you do that, uh, as just as in the Jupyter notebook tool, you have the all these menu options, which includes file. Uh, if you go into file, uh, you will uh, get, again, the listing of all the files that are um, associated with that particular instance of that tool session. Uh, and you will see here, there's a directory called SimTool. Uh, so if you further click on that, uh, you will then inside of that folder, uh, there's one, uh, basically one notebook file, the IPYNB is a, is a Python notebook file. Uh, if you open that up, this is the SimTool uh, notebook. And if you scroll through it or look through it, you'll see all of the um, basic sections that I outlined uh, in, the, in the earlier presentation. Uh, and yeah, okay. And you can, um, just like uh, Daniel was indicating, you can run the, you can run this notebook sort of standalone, um, just like any other notebook uh, to the top uh, and select, uh, I guess, cell and you can, you can run, just run all the cells and it'll run um, you know, from top to bottom, all the cells, and you'll see what kind of results are produced. And I would encourage you to, uh, you know, play with that a little bit. You know, don't be afraid to jump in and make some edits and see what happens. Um, debugging, but the printed values do not come back to the wherever you invoked the, the notebook from. Um, all right, so then uh, if, after you've done a little sort of exploration there, uh, if you make your way back to the um, workflow notebook, um, and you can do the same thing here, you can take a look at this and sort of you can compare it to the earlier notes and, and basically step through uh, the, the setup, there's a setup phase where you uh, set up your, your import your libraries, you, know, you find the tool, um, you get the inputs, um, you get the outputs and you have a look at those. Uh, here's a section where um, changing, uh, you know, the values of the inputs. Uh, this particular tool has, uh, one of the objectives of the tool was to use every different type uh, of input parameter in some way. So you'll see here there's integers and numbers, strings, arrays, so on. 
Um, not all of those you'll need today, but all of them are, um, you could hopefully see the use for. Um, and so you can try and change the values of any of those. You also note that some of these here um, are set to a file. So some types you can actually, instead of providing uh, maybe a big long string of text, you could just point to a file which contains the text. Uh, let's see, and then outputs again, uh, same sort of thing, examine what the SIM tool will produce. Uh, and then you, you run it by executing this cell. Um, and one of the results that we that's produced is uh, what we call a result summary. And this is produced for every um, SIM tool. And so basically it's a little table of all the, of all the um, uh, parameters that you listed as outputs, uh, their values at the end of the run and some more metadata about where they're located. Uh, there's in addition to the, the SIM tool defined outputs, there's two more variables here, which are the which basically indicate if there's an, an error, any error during the simulation, which is good to know. Um, and then at the end, basically, um, there's a, a bunch of cells that, that render each of the outputs. So some of them you'll find will be images, some of them are text, and some of them are you know so forth. So um, I think uh, maybe we can have like five minutes here. <laughs> for people to just um, jump in and sort of get um, get their hands dirty a little bit before we step into the sort of the homework or the, the tutorial problem that we actually want you to do some coding on. Um, and if there's any questions because I went too fast, we'd be happy to try and answer those as well.
Okay. Um, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to assume people are making good progress. Uh, but it's time to move on to the next um, section if we're going to get um, done on our, in our allotted time. Uh, so section um, number four is actually um, your opportunity to create your own SIM tool. And I've chosen um, what I hope is a reasonably sized problem. It's basically pendulum motion and um, with the damping factor applied. So to get started, uh, I, I'm going to give you some instructions on how to uh, basically clone, get to the point where you can clone a Git repository, which will have uh, the starting point uh, for what you need to do the to do the homework. Uh, the documentation uh, for today or the, the slides for today is also included in the repository. So you may want it uh, for that reason as well. Uh, so to start with, um, if you can, uh, you can either leave open uh, the intro tool uh, or you can close it uh, and open up. Uh, you can have multiple sessions running. Uh, we would just ask that at, at the end of the day, you basically close up anything you're not using. Uh, so we're going to go back uh, to the Jupyter tool, uh, as Daniel had illustrated earlier. Uh, so if, if you can find that, uh, we'll use that to um, get started. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so if, um, as Daniel uh, indicated earlier, uh, you can use the Jupyter tool to open up uh, a, a terminal window, which is basically just a very simple uh, scripting terminal window or the no VNC desktop. Uh, this is basically, I'm, I'm gonna take you into the window so that you can create a directory and run the git clone command. And uh, we shouldn't need to do much else with it. Um, there are other ways to, to do that, but this is, I think the easiest. So once you get inside your Jupyter Notebook tool, um, basically go to new and terminal. And you should get, like, I have to apologize for if this is not quite readable. I have a little problem with the tops of the fonts getting chopped off. But um, basically what uh, there's a set of, uh, was it three or four commands here? So, um, when you open the Jupyter tool, you will be uh, in your in your home directory, which is the standard Linux home directory. Uh, I think it makes sense to create um, a new directory, um, call it whatever you want, but I called it Gateways 21 Tutorial. Uh, so the command to do that is mkdir. Uh, once you make that directory, you want to change directory into that into the new the, the one that you just created. Uh, and once in there, then you need to issue this uh, git uh, clone command, which will um, download the repository, um, which contains uh, all the slides from today and uh, material for the sort of the homework or the, the, the pendulum problem. Uh, and if you come out of the terminal, you can hit uh, you can either just close the tab or you can hit control D at the end and it will terminate and then you close the tab. Uh, and if you go back to the Jupyter file interface, uh, you'll see uh, a new directory, which is the which was created by the git clone. Um, and if you go inside of that, uh, you'll see a sim tool directory and inside the sim tool directory, there's, there's basically three files. Um, there's a standard um, hub, hub tool template, which is very bare bones, has no, uh, it just has the mandatory cells in it, basically. Uh, and then there's a notebook that, that, you're, um, that you'll want to open because it has the problem statement and so forth. Uh, and there's also a figure in there, that, which is included in the notebook. And if you can open up the, the notebook, it should look like this, where we have um, basically a problem statement and then uh, followed by a bunch of cells, which your, your, your task for the day or the, for the time we have left uh, for, this, for this block is to fill in the, um, 
missing cells to define your parameters, define your inputs, define your outputs. Uh, there's some guidance here on how to write the algorithm to solve the, the, the pendulum problem. Um, you know, if, there, if anybody has questions on that, feel free to ask. Uh, so that's, I think, all I want to say here for the moment. So people can get started. Uh, we need probably 15 minutes or so at the end of the session uh, for another couple of uh, short talks. Uh, so if we can, um, that leaves us about 25 minutes or a little bit less uh, for people to, to get started on this. Um, so have at it and, and let's see how it goes. Steven, could you put the get clone command back up? Yeah, great, great idea. I mean, um, yeah, and um, yeah, during this section, I think feel free, people should feel free to use their microphone uh, or chat. Um, uh, I expect people to have uh, similar problems and, and we can help each other solve the problems as we go. Um, and since we can't see you, it's if, if we can hear you, it's useful. Hi, Stephen, we have another question. <clears throat> Someone wrote, um, after I clone, where do I go to get into my environment to play with the pendulum? Okay, uh, yeah. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the, basically in the black screen terminal window, if you just hit uh, control D, which will end the terminal session. And then you can also close that, that browser tab um, and that should put you back into um, a, a, a earlier tab where you had uh, the file browser, the file manager for the Jupyter Notebook session up. And that's where you need to be. Um, and you should find the directory, which is the name of the, of the repository. Um, click down into that and then click SimTool and then open the Pendulum Notebook. And the other thing I'll say, um, yeah, in uh, when you get into the um, the Git repository directory, uh, where I mentioned there's a sim tool directory, there's also a doc directory, DOC. Uh, in, in the doc directory are all the slides from today. Uh, so you can um, open up those slides as well. And they're PDFs, so they, they may open within the notebook as well. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I hope they do. <laughs> Did you find what you needed? Okay, the answer from this person was yes, but if anybody else uh, has questions, Speak up, you don't, you can chat or turn on your mic. There are two different pendulum notebooks. One is kind of empty and the other one's in the sim tool directory. Yes, uh, you're correct. 
uh, the one you want to go with the one inside the sim tool directory to start with. The the other the second one or the uh, is in the in the directory above that, and that will be used later to call or invoke the. That's the workflow notebook. It's, it is much simpler, um, and also um, that uh, also needs to be um, filled out. But the primary one to work on is the sim tool notebook.
well, everybody, I'm going to break in here for a minute. Um, I hope people are making progress. I'm suspicious that we probably didn't leave enough time for everybody to finish. Um, but th there is another option. Um, basically, uh, within the, the repository that you cloned, there's also a, a set of solutions for this problem. Um, and there's a couple of simple um, commands you need to run to access that uh, solution. So again, um, if you return to a terminal window, uh, uh, the same as before, uh, and navigate your way to the uh, Git repository, which is this Gateways 21 tutorial directory. Uh, you can issue the command uh, Git checkout solution, and uh, that will make the uh, included uh, SimTool notebook and the workflow notebook um, available to you uh, again through the uh, Jupyter um, uh, browser, the file uh, browser. Uh, the file names are different, so they shouldn't clash with anything you've developed so far. Uh, so instead of pendulum, they're called pendulum solution. Uh, so keep those two straight. Um, and I think we have just probably another five, just five minutes or so to have people work on this. And then we'll, we have, uh, Daniel has another uh, presentation we'd like to share with you.
okay so i hope you you have like uh, at least a version a working version of the scene tool uh this is just a good exercise to understand how to create this like workflow when you have really well defined inputs and outputs and that is how basic a scene tool is it's just a notebook when you have to define those well well-defined metadata about your workflow but as Steve mentioned in some of the slides at the beginning, one of the features of SIM tools is this automatic results caching. So what it means is, well, now that you created something like this, you have a set of inputs, you have your notebook that do all the research, all the scientific part, and you have a set of outputs, but it's well-defined. What you can define is a identifier that characterize all those inputs. So we call it an squid, a serialized query identifier. So when you, based on the inputs that you pass it to the SIM tool, you can, you can decide if that squid is from a caching point of view, so it's already cached, or you have to run a new simulation and you get the results from two different systems, from the caching of the research work. How SIM tools implemented are three different levels of caching. So the caching could be local, so basically when you run your simulation, you get some results. So the next time that you want it, you can just get those results from there. But if you publish your uh, SIM tool in one of the Hub Zero hubs, what you get is you can decide if you want to save the global cache in a file system or an API uh, data storage management. So how it does, if you are familiar with the Hub Zero configuration, this is how the session container settings looks. And now it's a new environment variable called a squid database. So basically if that squid database parameter contain a valid URL. This will be calling the W service data store. That is basically an API service that know how to handle the get and put for files. And if it's an invalid, it will go to the file system where you define that in, in your configuration. So if you try to run a simulation the first time we will see what you have been doing with your simulation it will run and go step by step running all the cells that you define in your workflow but as soon as it's cache and you try to run the simulation you got the result directly from the cache or you are optimizing the time on your resources instead of reusing everything so that is the base of the cache but the caching that is implemented on Simtool is a little bit more, and that is what I call the Simtool ecosystem of microservices. So right now, when you are a user, a workflow, an application, you are interacting with the Hub Zero API. But internally in the Hub Zero middle, where you have different web services that handle different stuff. One is in charge of all the submissions to the HPC resources, another is in charge of all the caching, and an additional one in charge of the indexation of those caching. So what it means in the indexation of your cache. So if you look at your workflow, you have the input, you have the outputs, but given that you add the new squid that defines like the data that is associated with that specific job, that information become like a row in a data table, a big data table of research data. So all your inputs, outputs are indexed and created in a database that you can start querying and getting access to that uh, information without running a simulation from scratch. So globally, you will see that you have the API in the CMS, the Hub Zero CMS that is a PHP uh, web service, but you have different microservices that is like the cache, the results and the submit, how we call it in the services. The, User endpoint is DB Explorer, and there is some documentation. So for now, I'm going to use a package called NanoHub Remote that allows you to connect to that API instead of running just console commands. So it will just simplify to create the session and all the authentication for that. So if you want to access that, so you will use NanoHub Remote. NanoHub Remote requires your credentials. So if you are running outside of NanoHub, you have to define what are your user, your password, and your client ID and client secret uh, credentials that need to be created with those links. 
But if you are inside of a session, you can reuse the token that is in that session. So you can load it from the resources file and reuse the authentication that you already have. And you can then from that session that you use your credentials, you can say, well, I want to list what are the same tools that are available that are published on that hub. So you will get a list of the, the same tools and all the versions that are published. Um, for each of those specific same tools, you can request details like give me what are the inputs, what are the outputs that are expecting from that same tool without running any, any instruction. So you will get the parameters that you expect from that same tool, what are the labels and the type, and then you can start querying and get information from that specific. So the way to do it is you create filters. So if you know the squid, you can directly give me what are the results for that specific identifier that I have for the simulation. But I'm not interested in all the results. I'm interested in the subset of results. So you can define what do you want from that database to return. In this case, this example, I'm interested in the P, N, and I from the device. I will explain a little bit about that one. And the equilibrium potential equilibrium uh, intrinsic. So for this one, I'm going to use a sim tool called PN Junction, ST for PN Junction, that what is trying to simulate something like that. You have a device that have an N and a P doped uh, section of your device. And what you are trying to is apply voltage in one end and measure some characteristic of that device in the end. So you configure a setting, you run the simulation, and at the end you get some specific curve of your simulation. So if I ask the a database give me those results, I will get something like this. Yeah. If I go to the SIM tool, that is how their workflow looks like in that SIM tool. So I have all the parameters. I can run the simulation. It will go to the SIM tool. It most probably will be cached already. And I got a specific result from that SIM tool. Uh, but I can do a little bit more than that. I can be asking, well, Given that I have an a specific value for the end lane, I lane of the device that I run or the ID that I have, I can give me one, some of the results that are similar to that. So give me results when the length, the N and the I part is the same, but the P can vary, can be different. And you can plot that information in the same way. So now I have multiple results without running any simulation. I'm getting all the results directly from the database. So that is what I'm going to go now. Just as Steve showed you before, if you clone this, I go to a terminal. In this terminal, I'm going to clone the repository. I'm just cloning the branch of solution. So now I have this gateway 2021 20, folder but with the solutions inside of it. And I have this database explorer sim tool. So if I open that sim tool, uh, that notebook, I can see is uh, the, the, the code that I already chose. So I can run it, create the session. And when I got the session, I can start question like, give me all the sim tools that I have there. I will get all the results. If I say, give me what is the, the description of that, ST4P injunction, I can give me what are the inputs. Uh, I can list the specific keys if I want it. I can get the outputs and start doing queries. Like for the ID that I have, I will get a specific output equilibrium, uh, equilibrium A, equilibrium potential. But I can say, well, now I'm interested in also in the total current hole. So I can just add it to my query. And I have a typo here. And if I run it, now my data frame is include that result. So I can start getting more information from that result without running the simulation. Uh, as I said, I want to plot that result. I will get the, the potential and the intrinsic energy. Or I can start giving that N and I length. I can just filter and get more results based on that. So if I run it, I will say, give me all the data frame for that information. I get all the characteristics. It say, 
well, but I'm interested also in adding like a different end length, like this one should be four instead of what I have for the, and I will get the results immediately without running the simulation because everything is indexed in a database. And if I can run the simulation. So that gives you a completely different point of view of how to deal with your simulation because now you have research data before running a simulation, you can start creating interactive apps. So if you go to that folder, to the Gateways 20 tutorial, you have database, database Explorer Sintool app. So this one is just an app that take advantage of that database. So I'm just going to run all those parameters. And what is that is it gives you all the results that I have for a specific configuration without different dopings. So I can see what is happening with the topping when I increase the D value, when I increase the end value. So I can start getting some idea and I can say, well, let me for a different P, I get different results from that configuration. I can even say, well, if I'm interested in a specific point, I want to run my SIM tool and run it with a different configuration like 18, 18, and then I can, it seems like I have an error. Let me just rerun it. Let me see if I can do it now. So 18 with 18, so I submit it. Now the job is allocated, and now it's just sending that specific simulation to one of the web services in the backend and I will get the result back. But I can even create something more like uh, professional some way. And I say, well, I want to create this just a web app for that SIM tool that use the simulation. So I can get my credentials and say, now I want just to simulate and get the results from that. I get the immediately result from the cache and I can start exploring all the results that I have in that API endpoint. So the SIM tools give you a lot more than just the caching itself. It gives you some different ways to interact with the data. So that is one of the main benefits of those SIM tools. So that was my part. I think Steve has some slides to close the tutorial. I do. <laughs> um, let's see here if we can share the screen. We have that. Okay, so I just have a couple slides here. It's we're about the end of our hour and a half, um, so not not so bad. Uh, I basically wanted to touch on a couple more advanced topics um, uh, and integrating sim tools and how they. Uh, you know, sort of interact with the rest of Hub Zero. Uh, Daniel just covered everything uh, to do with caching, so I won't say anything more about that. Uh, but something we haven't talked about, it's been sort of implicit that, that the computing um, uh, that sort, sort of serves as the back end for the SIM tools, uh, from what we've shown you so far, all just happens within uh, Hub Zero hardware. Uh, but we have the option to uh, sort of export those simulations to um, external resources. And we do this by uh, building uh, singularity containers with combined with Anaconda environments. Uh, so this, this gives us some portability, it gives us some reproducibility and all of those other uh, nice fair uh, features. Uh, and we can then um, use uh, external HPC or resources, uh, clusters at various universities or you know whatever your hub has access to uh, and it also gives us options to um, access um, GPU uh, computational GPU environments uh, which are uh, beneficial for the machine learning kind of environment tools that people might want to use sim tools for uh, the second thing I want to talk a little bit about uh, just briefly is uh, sort of to wrap up the fair stuff is uh, within Hub Zero, you, of course, you've created this SIM tool. And I mentioned earlier, you want 
it, you want to make it available to others. So the way you do that is you, is, uh, you go through a publication process for the tool, just like any other HubZero tool. Uh, and when you do that, um, every tool gets a, a digital object identifier uh, and also makes it uh, indexable through the Web of Science and Google Scholar, uh, which sort of sp spreads the word and, and makes it more accessible. Uh, and then uh, basically, uh, in summary, uh, come back to this slide that we've shown before. Uh, and I think hopefully we've demonstrated that we're applying the FAIR principles to computation as well as data. And that's summarized here. And I just will repeat this uh, additional resource slide again. Um, and as I mentioned, all of these slides are included in, in the Git repository you clone. So you now have it uh, accessible in your NanoHub environment. Uh, your NanoHub environment will it, Will not go away. Um, it's it's yours to keep as, and use as long as you want. Uh, it, it, it was nothing special done for with regards to the to this uh, tutorial or conference. So that's that's yours to keep and deal with. Um, if you happen to be um, associated with a hub other than NanoHub and you want to integrate Sim tools into your environment, let us know. Uh, there's a little bit of work to be done to so that it shows up here on the on the contribution page, um, but we can get that um, set up for you if, if that's useful. Uh, and then I just, uh, I guess in closing, like to thank everybody for attending and bearing with us for an hour and a half. Um, I don't know if we have time to run over or I don't know what's next on the agenda, but if people have questions, uh, we'll stick around for a little bit and maybe we can answer, answer a couple. So again, thank you for attending. We, we had one question that came in the chat, Steve. Um, Steven, we had uh, this question. Is Sim Tools essentially a notebook replacement for Rapture? Uh, yes, uh, to, some, to some extent, that is correct. Uh, so uh, Rapture is the older um, uh, product that we used for uh, building tool interfaces, uh, both uh, data sort of data simulation and uh, user interface is all kind of wrapped into one thing called Rapture. Uh, it's still on the hubs, it's still available. Um, it hasn't had development for a while, uh, so, but it, it still works. And if you go to, to NanoHub, you will, it's very evident that it's still in use. Uh, but the idea is that uh, as we move forward, uh, new tools or, or maybe even some of the old Rapture tools will, will moving to this newer technology as, as we go. So th thanks for the question. Yeah. Well, thank you again to, to Stephen and Daniel. Um, I'm going to give some clapping. <laughs> um, one, one last thank you. <laughs>